Hello and welcome to another exclusive interview by Recovery Today Magazine at recoverytodaymagazine.com where first and foremost we are a magazine to hope. Whether you're considering addiction recovery for yourself or loved one or you're actively in uh, addiction or recovery a short time or maybe it's for many, many years, you're going to find all kinds of information on topics related to addiction, recovery, really living a happy, successful, and sober life here at Recovery Today. My name is Rob Hanley. I'm the editor-in-chief of Recovery Today, and today I'm joined by a really, really cool guest. This guy is an absolute superhuman, like bringing Superman superhuman. He is <clears throat> known as the fittest man on earth. Let that sink in for just a second. He was crowned fittest man on earth, and that title at uh, his first win of the CrossFit Men's Invi in, uh, Invitational, excuse me, Individual Competition, and he won that in 2016 by the largest margin in history, in the CrossFit Games history, and then he won it again three more consecutive years straight with even wider margins to his own records. Again, the guy is an absolute beast, a superhuman, in my opinion, and, of course, why he's on recovery today, he happens to be sober since the age of 17 years old. Please meet Matt Frazier. Matt, welcome, man. Thanks for hey, taking Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it, and as we we're talking again here, I know that you're working out like multiple, many times per day type of thing, and so today, Monday, we're doing this here being your day off. It's funny that you even got a day. I guess you'd have to have a day off. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, man. Thanks for taking a minute to jump on. Yeah, absolutely. So, hey, um, I'm going to jump kind of right into it here. I, I couldn't wait because... I love fitness. I mean, first of all, I'm old. I'm 54 years old. So, you know, I love professional athletes and stuff like that from, like, way back in the day, stuff that I could do that I find, you know, if I try to do it, I <laughs> injure myself. It takes a long time to heal today. Uh, but back in the day, I did CrossFit. Uh, I, I did it for a couple of years. Um, I started out with my very cool neighbor, shout out to Coach Anthony in his garage here in my neighborhood, which is a lot of crossfitters <laughs> do. Um, I did it for a couple years. Uh, I never uh, experienced any workout where eight to ten minutes, I'm not going to die, like literally oh, going to no. die, dude. You, so, you think you will, yeah? Absolutely. You think that you will. So what you do, and, and, and by the way, I told him that I was going to interview you the other day, and you're... You're a legend, man, in, in, in the CrossFit community, Le legend. So, but for those that are not familiar maybe with CrossFit, the, I mean, it's a rabid zillions of people following this. Maybe people know it's multifunctional type mm -hmm. of stuff, whatever, but tell us a little bit of who you are, your story, and kind of kick us off kind of that way. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you know sum, sum it up real quick, you know, super – normal childhood in terms of, you know, playing sports and all that stuff. Um, I actually competed in Olympic weightlifting uh, all through middle school, high school, college. Um, and then, you know, once once it was time to hang that up, uh, you know, I focused on school and uh, I went from training two, three times a day to nothing at all. And not only did I have all this extra free time on my hands and I was kind of at loose ends, I didn't have a purpose. Um, you know, I, I, I was also just kind of gaining weight and got the freshman 15 that most do and, you know, just wanted to get back in shape, had no interest in competing again. So I just kind of went into a CrossFit gym and I basically told the owner, I was like, hey, I have no interest in doing CrossFit. I want, I'm here <laughs> to use your barbells and bumpers. Uh, I'll be in the back corner doing weightlifting if that's okay. And he was like, yep, totally cool. And, uh, you know, did that for a couple months and then slowly started getting dragged into more CrossFit stylish workouts. You know, they, they would entice me if it was a, a workout with a lot of uh, the Olympic lifts and um, Snatch, all the snatch, you know. Kind yeah, of exactly. It was I, I remember the first one I did was uh, it was 30 clean and jerks for time at 225 pounds and uh you know, like I've never had that feeling in my lungs before. Like it, like you're kind of, you can like taste pennies because it's just like you're breathing so hard. It feels like your yeah. lungs are bleeding. And I was like, oh man, um, you know, I was in agony. But once I finished, you know, the people around me told me, they're like, oh my God, that's like crushed that workout. 
and uh, uh, yeah, you know, started doing some small local competitions. The first competition I actually did was in house, so it was at the gym I was attending. They were hosting a competition, and the owner told me, "He's like, I want you to sign up for this. Um, I think you could be really good." And I said, "Cool, I'm in." Uh, and then I saw that it was a fifty dollar registration fee, and I said, "Hey, sorry, man, I don't have fifty bucks." <laughs> and so he said, "Okay, I'll sign you up, but if you win any money, you need to uh, buy a pair of CrossFit shoes." And uh, so he signed me up for the competition. I won it, uh, and first it was five hundred. Won the first competition you did. Yeah, yeah, first competition. Um, it was five hundred dollars. You're, you're you're from Vermont. Is this up in Vermont or? Yeah, yeah, in, it's in uh, Willis, Wilston, Vermont, Champlain okay. Valley CrossFit. Okay. And uh, it was five hundred dollar prize, and that was the most money I'd ever won. And I was like, oh my god, this is incredible! I have five hundred dollars. <laughs> and and so I asked. I was like, you know, are there competitions like this? Like, are you the only one doing it? Or are there more of these? And they were like, oh no, there's these competitions all the time. And so I just started. I would You're drive like, I around, got a job, man. Dude, I would drive around New England, and if any competition, I, like anything over a hundred bucks, I was there because I, I was a full time college student. I was broke. I was driving a hoopty of a car. I was living with my parents. I was full time uh, engineering student at UVM. So if I had an opportunity to, you know, drive a couple hours, make a couple hundred bucks, and then be on time for class, I was I was all in. Uh, and so I literally just started every, I would try to book out every weekend if I could. Um, and it, it just slowly started growing, you know, um, it started with a in-house competition for 500 bucks and then quickly it was, the next one was a thousand, then 2000, 4,000, 10,000, uh, you know, for a full-time college student grabbing a couple grand every weekend, I was like, oh, this is this is awesome. Money, dude. Like, you don't even have to get a job, man. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it, it was kind of funny. I kind of did look at it a little bit. I, I don't want to say like a job, but like a side hustle. So, you know, I would prepare for it during the week. You know, I would look back at the previous week's competition. It's okay, what workouts did I do poorly in? Why did I do poorly in it? Uh, was it a movement? Was it a time domain? Was it a stimulus? You know, what was my problem? And then I would take the week and I was treated like a test the next weekend. You know, I would study. I would study for the test that whole week, and then show up to the next competition, take my test, and see if I, I got a good grade or not. Um, yeah, and so it's it was literally just a huge, just real kind of like engineering methodical. Yeah, I I've, I've treated every competition, or I treated treated my training like um like a math like, problem, like problem solving. Yeah, you know, it was okay. What am I bad at? Why am I bad at it? How do I get better? What are the variables? Um, what are exactly. the variables in the equation type of It's thing? like, you know, and it it was even taking stuff into account of like, okay, was I am I good at this movement because like that body part is developed or is my body just the right build for it or you know, okay, did I do well in that event because of who was showing up and you know there weren't other people there to beat me. You know, there's so many variables to take into account and uh and I treated it just like an engineering problem of sitting down and trying to look at what weight each variable had um, and just try to be better for the next one. Nice, man. Nice. So you did you ever get it? So did you graduate in engineering? Did you finish or did you? Uh, yeah. You yeah. So I, yeah. So I went to University of Vermont. I actually got a double major, double minor. I got one degree in mechanical engineering and uh, one in business and uh yeah, I I competed. I think I did one year. Oh no, I I did two years competing at the CrossFit Games while I was still in school. Um, wow. My first year competing, I was I was actually working a uh, aerospace internship at a at a company in Vermont, and uh, and that, that was a pretty eye opening experience for me because it was. Uh, it just reminded me of you know the movie Office Space. Yeah, yeah. Where it's just like gray carpet, gray cubicle, cubicle gray ceilings. Yeah. Like, oh, it. Like I, 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 actually got asked one time if I had a case of the Mondays, and I was like, oh my god, this is my life now. And yes. I, I went, oh, fuck this. 
Yeah. And that 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 was the summer that I pushed all the chips in on on CrossFit because before that it was you know school's priority. I was always my plan was always to work as an engineer, um, and then CrossFit was just going to supply a nice nest egg for when I started yeah. my regular nine to five. Yeah. And then I got a taste of the nine to five in in uh, the typical American workplace, and I went, nope, I, not I, for I, me. I, I was there myself when I started my first job. I, I had a degree in engineering, and I remember getting my first job. And um, you know, I'd work fifty hours a week or something like that, mm-hmm. fifty-five hours a week. I was you know in my twenties, and I remember driving home. Actually, it'd take me like an hour to drive home. And following, plus I live in Seattle. I live in Seattle. It's rainy. It's dark in the middle of the winter. Following yeah. like miles of red tail lights. And I'm thinking, this sucks balls, man. Like, I get home, I can maybe go to the gym and get work out a little bit, come home, eat, watch some TV, and i got to go to bed like an hour and then wake yeah. up the next day. This sucks, man. And then my you know, older sister tells me, well, you know, get used to it. You're going to do it for like another 50 years. I'm like, yeah. This, this sucks. But yeah. let, me, let me do this. Before we jump too far into CrossFit and stuff like that, I mean, we have a lot of people – um, in um, being the recovery community, people really transform themselves, you know, from an addict, from uh, 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 you know, addiction and something that's very bad for their body. It's mm-hmm. not uncommon to find people uh, get heavily into yoga, powerlifting, uh, bodybuilding, and things like that. But for those that maybe don't really understand or appreciate, I guess I would say, what CrossFit is. I started out by saying, you know, I thought I was going to die in one of these workouts, and it was eight to ten minutes long. It wasn't something I said like, so what is the, I mean, the whole workout, like for somebody who's going to be in the gym an hour and a half or people bodybuilding, like a CrossFit workout, what's a normal CrossFit workout? Um, so, I mean, what what I do as CrossFit is drastically, drastically different than okay. if you show up to a CrossFit gym That's as I mean. you're, and, and you're taking a class. Yes. But two totally different things. Oh, uh, okay, um, all right. So a typical CrossFit, you know, they're, the, the typical format is it's a one-hour class. The coach, you're going to show up. They're going to tell you. They're going to gather the class together and go through, all right, this is what we're doing for a warm-up. This is the workout. This is the equipment you'll need, and then this is what we're going to do as a cool down. And you're in and out of the gym in an hour. Yeah. Um, my typical schedule is very different. Um, I usually do about a four-hour session at a time. Wow. Um, and I'll, you know, up at eight a.m. Um, I'll usually take an hour for just coffee, relaxing. Um, and then it's like, you know, the warm up starts, the body mobility, uh, show up to the gym. We're usually there no less than three, usually about four hours, get home, eat, try to eat my body weight, uh, put my feet up for an hour, do that whole thing again of, you know, starting mobility work, another usually three hours in the gym for the second session, um, get home. Massive calories, man. Yeah, I can't I can't eat as many as I'm I'm supposed to. I have to take in a majority of my calories like in liquid form. Um yeah, so after the second session, huge meal again. Um and then I'll do a lot more body work, you know, whether it's uh my fiance Sammy is like doing actual PT massage on me, uh sauna, ice bath, uh and then usually try to give myself about an hour before I go to bed and then do it all over. It's weird because although, you know, people can go, yeah, I go to the gym or I work out or I do a class, like I guess even CrossFitters, you know, I do a CrossFit class type of a thing somebody Mm -hmm. was saying is. The interesting thing is, I mean, you are, and it's funny as I was getting ready for the, as I said before we started recording, like, you're a professional athlete. Like, I mean, like, it's, it, does, it shouldn't be surprising. Like, if you played on an NFL team, that's what you'd do. You'd yeah. go in, study film, you'd work out, you'd eat, you'd do such and such, you'd go back. So I, I get it, man. But let me jump a little kind of back into some kind of the mental health and some of the mm-hmm. stuff like that in your story. As I was reading about it, I mean, obviously, as I said in the beginning, you've been sober since you were 17 years old. Yeah. And being the parent of a uh, an 18-year-old, 
I will say I find it astounding, first of all, that you would have the kind of the deep thought to realize that you had an issue because I, I don't even know. Sometimes I think I'm speaking uh, a different language to my 18-year-old in terms of lack of you know communication. But uh, you were you were set to have a, a full ride as I was reading an Olympic training center. Yeah. But what I had read was you said I knew I had an addictive personality and it was showing. Was this something from your family? Like, how does a 17 year old have that kind of thought, man? So I mean, I, I definitely did not come to that conclusion on my own. Okay. Um, uh, alcoholism runs in the family. Um, my dad. My dad was actually in the rooms for like 30 years. Um, so, you know, like I, I remember being super young. And your it was dad's like, in recovery for like 30 years type of yeah. stuff. And so yeah. everybody from the time you're a little dude, even before you're born, they're all well, on the lookout to see if you got the gene type of thing. Oh, oh, 100%. Oh, yeah. They, I mean, like my, my dad knew like day one, like, oh, yeah. You're just like me. Are you ADD too, or anything like that? Also, or anything? Else? No, <laughs> no, okay. no. Um, I am. Yeah, so I, like I, I remember like going to my dad's uh, home group, like annual potluck, and and I remember like I, I never knew what it was. I never knew what his home group was. I just knew, oh no, this is my dad's home group, but I didn't know home group of. What you know? I'm Thurs not. Thursday nights, you know, he would finish up dinner, and he'd usually have to leave the table before everyone else was done, because it was, oh no, Thursday nights is Dad's meeting night, and it, that was just a fact of life. I, I never knew what the meeting was, right? Um, but I knew I thought everyone's dad on Thursday night at six thirty went yeah. went to their meeting. Um, so so you know, I always knew of that there. Um. But then when I was pretty young, I was probably 12, 13 years old, and my dad was always encouraging me to hang out with this other group of guys um, that were, like, mid-20s. And I always thought, this is really weird. Why does my dad want me to hang out with these guys? And it was always like they were into dirt biking, four-wheeling, stuff like that. And every weekend... Um, you know, my, my dad's buddy, Nate, who was way younger than my dad, way older than me, um, my dad would call him, like, hey, like, you guys going four-wheeling this weekend? He'd be like, yeah. He's like, all right, swing by the house, pick up Matt. And so he would pull into the house. He'd usually have one or two other dudes in his pickup truck with him. We'd load in our dirt bikes and go. And you know, it was really odd for me. You know, I liked them all. They were really fun. Um, but your dad's like – purposefully influencing you as sober role, male role models. Yeah, because he knew he knew I was about at the age where I was like, you know, going to start experimenting, getting in trouble, all that stuff, and he knew this guy Nate was having clean fun with friends. He knew that if I were with Nate, there were going to be no drugs or alcohol. Um, but I remember like climbing in and like some of these dudes are like fresh into the room, so we're, like, you know, just like very rough looking individuals and that was the normal for me. That like I knew all these guys, right? And uh, and it wasn't until later on that I was like, oh, that's why you wanted me to hang out with Nate. You know, he he's he's been clean for you know ten years or whatever. Um, but for a long time, I would hang out during the day with them. We'd finish up four wheeling. They they would all be going to a meeting. They would drop me off back at home. I'd meet up with my friends go drink, do whatever we were doing, and they, they would all go to a meeting. And I remember one time, I was probably about 15, and there wasn't enough time to get me back home before they all went to their meeting. And so I was like, no, oh, I'll just tag along. Like, it's no big deal. I'll just sit in the back. Don't worry. And, uh, and it was my buddy Nate was doing a speaker meeting. And so he's up, and by halfway through the meeting, I'm just crying in the back. Because, you know, I'd always thought, like, oh, okay, you know, I don't really drink like a lot of my friends and, you know, this and that. And then uh, listening to him. And you're about, was, like, what, 16 or so, I'm guessing? I'm, I'm like, 15 probably. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, listening to him tell his story, and it was, like, a mirror image of my life. And I went, oh, my God. It's, like, it, it was, the writing was on the wall. It's, like, oh, I'm an alcoholic. 
and you know like any stubborn 15 year old you know I, I took a couple more licks and I, I didn't I didn't turn it in right away you know uh, still wanted to learn the lesson the hard way but um, but then you know when the decision came to clean up my act and you know get some help um, the hurdles were very low you know I like half my network of friends were already in the program um, so that made life pretty simple and you know I didn't have the big intimidating trying to meet someone and all right, how do I meet these new people where do I go for a meeting all this stuff half my network was already sober you seem like really confident I'm, I'm, I mean now obviously and, and I just again think about them uh, and I want to get into it some of the mentality of like pushing yourself and some of the David Goggins mm -hmm. type I love David Goggins <laughs> but the whole mental side of things but when you were a kid, like, did you have any kind of uh, self-esteem issues or anything like oh, that? Oh, huge, or, huge, you know, yeah. Like, I'm I, I was, enough, or I'm a fuck up, or you know, hundred percent. Everybody's smarter uh, than me, or whatever it would be. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, so I mean, in school, uh, yeah, everyone's smarter than me. Um, come to find out, you know, I figured out I'm, I was blind and deaf, so I couldn't see the chalkboard in school. Couldn't hear what the teacher was saying. So, you know, that gave some setbacks right away. Um, what do you mean by that, blind and deaf? Like, you're really, like your eyesight's not good? You oh, my, my eyesight was so terrible. Like, I didn't understand how the other kids were taking notes. I would, like, the entire class, I would have to be looking off the kid next to me's note paper. Um, and then deaf, like, uh, I remember, like, elementary school, I, I was getting fitted for hearing aids and stuff. Like, I was oh, wow. just deaf as a door now. Um, yeah, so, yeah, in school, you know, obvious regular insecurities. Um, I remember taking a reading test, and, you know, like, I read it, like, a third grade level, you know. Uh, I'm just very slow at reading, so that just creates huge insecurities of, like, you know, a teacher assigns a, one chapter for homework, and all the other kids are, oh, it's going to take, like, 30 minutes. I'm like, dude, that's going to take me, like, all night. Um, and, yeah, so... Yep. Suck at reading. Uh, I, I think I scored a perfect score on my SAT in the math. Um, so when the guidance counselor saw, like, oh, perfect score on the SAT in your math, um, I got asked if I missed the reading section on my SATs. No way. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. and so I was like, nope, definitely didn't miss that. And they were like, oh, cool, you should be an engineer. Yeah, that's funny, man. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, like I had friends in high school. I was friends with like the like popular kids, but I never quite fit in. Like I was always a little different. Um, and so you know, there there was always those insecurities of like never quite fitting in. Never like I never knew what it was, you know. Um, and and it wasn't until much much later in life that I became comfortable in my own skin. Um, when did and, you start realizing that you're smart? Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, there's still times where totally, I'm like, man, I'm the same, Oof. but you know, like, what the hell were you thinking there, dude? Like, that was a pretty dumb move. Um, yeah. Uh, I it, it wasn't until a couple years into college, yeah, that I realized, like, oh, I'm I'm able I'm to not learn as this dumb stuff. as I thought I was. Exactly. Yeah. yeah it wasn't. Same so thing. I, I always knew I always knew I was good at math, um, and I had one teacher who was incredibly influential in my life. Uh, in sixth grade, I was he was the math teacher, and and I was the biggest shit disturber in his class. And he realized very early on it was that I, I was still getting I was getting perfect grades in his class, and the reason I was disturbing everyone is because I would get all my work done in like five ten minutes because it was so easy for me. And then I had I would just have to sit idle for 45 minutes. And so I remember he walked over to the high school, got a geometry book, and he came in. Oh, he was pissed. And he just, like, slammed it on the table and said, this is what you're learning now. And I was like, no, I don't want to. Like, this other stuff's really easy. I want to keep doing that. And he was like, nope, this, like, I will give you. So he literally gave me, like, a one-on-one -on -one class because he was sick of me disturbing the other kids. Um, and I, like, that's why I went into engineering was because I did geometry in sixth grade, algebra in seventh grade, wow. and just like carried on from there. Um, so yeah, I, I think I always knew I was good at math, 
But then it wasn't until college, a couple years into college, where you know I'm starting to take some high level courses and and the big part was I had an interest in learning the stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah so I, I'd say yeah you know it wasn't until my early twenties that I was like oh shit okay I can yeah. I can do this. I had the same kind of thing for many years. I thought, you know, I'm really not that smart. Like, it takes me, and especially, like, when you get into college, there's people in engineering. I remember there's people that would finish their test. You know, I'd get 25 on a 100-point test. Yeah. Pretty demoralizing after I'd study for four days. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there was a dude that had turned his test in in, like, 14 minutes, and he did yeah. 99 or 100. You really start to understand, you know, there's it's not level playing field. There's people that are actually a lot smarter but it wasn't until a few years later I started to realize, you know, there's, I got other skills. There's, there's, I'm actually not as dumb as I thought that I was. Yeah. But it all comes so, back overall to, to, to the kind of the self-esteem part of it, though. So I remember I, I, I had one uh, like life-changing course, and it's like what I learned in that has reflected in everything I do now. And uh, it was in engineering, and I, it was thermodynamics. And you know, it's kind of knowing it's a weed out course like yeah. fail as many as you can to yeah. you know first year not engineer everybody course. can be an engineer not everybody can be an engineer they, yeah they, and so they're trying to get kids to realize like i don't want to do this for the next four years they don't want kids changing their major three years in so it's like all right if you get through this you have a, a good chance of getting through yeah. um the course grade was only three exams uh no homework grade no attendance they didn't give a shit and uh you know, first exam, I think I got an 18 out of 100. And the average in the class was like a 34. Yeah, man. And Demoralizing, man. Yeah. Second exam, uh, you know, average, my, my grade was about the same. And I'm like, holy shit, I'm going into the final. Two-thirds of my grade is already failing. And so the teacher said, you know, if your final is your highest grade, that's your grade for the course. And... Um, and that was a moment that I was like, no, like I, I want to be an engineer. I want to finish this. I'm not going to let this one fucking course determine yeah. the next, potentially my life. Yeah. Um, and so that's what I, I took the mentality of like, okay, what can he throw at me on this test that would throw me off? I better learn that. Um, and, and that, that was a, I, I learned how to learn in that course of going through and learning, figuring out what don't I know, what what material, like if he's lecturing and he says the word entropy and I'm like, oh shit, what What's was that? that word? Well, I better write down the word entropy and then go learn it. And, yeah. you know, so I, I learned how to learn in that course. Um, and that was a big thing for me. That was something that carried on through all the other courses of, so okay, today, like, yeah, no no one comes uh, into these courses knowing the material. No one walks into the room knowing everything. Um, so it's like, okay, how do I learn this stuff? And the exact same of, you know, the first time you walk into a gym, it's very intimidating. It's like, yeah. why does everyone know what to do and where everything is? And how does everyone already know all the other people? It's like, all right, well, like, I now know how to assess that situation and, and like, figuring out the resources of learning what to do. Um, and I mean, it applies to everything. You know, you, you realize like, oh, like, you know, your first meeting, walking in, it's terrifying. Yeah. But it's like, no, everyone has been here for the first time at one are point or another. Are you still a student today? Are you still, do you still read? And are you, are you a personal development kind of guy? Or Big, big time into personal development. I just started reading um, probably about a year ago. Yeah. Um, you know, because I was a very slow reader and, you know, the material that the, the schools give you, you know, it has to be very generic and apply to everyone. Um, I hated reading. I mean, when, when I was 25, I, I, I remember looking at it and being like, well, someone asked me, what was the last book you read? And I was like, I don't know, like The Giver in sixth grade? I never fucking read a book. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> I, I forget what the first book I read was. Oh, I think it was a buddy was staying with me, like probably a year and a half ago, and he left. He accidentally left a book here, and I kind of like picked it up and just skimmed it. I was like, oh, this is really interesting. And yeah, like I'm a slow reader, but yeah, like, I realized that I don't hate reading. I hate yeah. reading that doesn't interest me. Like I'm pretty slow too, but I have good, pretty good comprehension. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like I, I have 
when when I read something, it sticks with me. I understand yeah. it. Um, I'm just slower. Um, but yeah, w- once I realized, like, oh, I I kind of enjoy reading. It's, you know, if it's about something that's applicable to me or something that I can apply to my own life or something that's making me think in a new way. Um, so now I, I usually now I usually have one, if not two, books on the go. Um, you know, I read every night. I read every night before bed. Um, I try to I try to get in the habit of reading in the mornings, um, like not touching my phone for the first hour of the day. Wow, that is so weird that you say that, man. I do the same. I just recently started doing. I, I love football, especially this time of year. It's a playoff, yeah. and so every Monday morning, particularly, like, yeah. so I got to get my coffee, and then I literally—it's like an addiction. I can't wait to sit and read the news about. I'm a Seahawks fan because I live in Seattle. Yeah, I can't wait. Wait to read the news about everything about everything about the football game. But just recently, I started leaving the phone upstairs, the two bedroom house. And I'll get my coffee, and then there's my books. Mm-hmm. And I find that once, like, it's like working out, man. Like, once I start reading, then I get into it, you know, mm-hmm. instead of getting on this. It was, I forget who said it to me, um, but they, they pointed out, they go, all right, when, like, if you wake up, and as soon as you open your eyes, you reach the bedside table, grab a bottle of booze, and start drinking, what's... What's very obvious is, like, oh, I have a drinking problem. Like, if as soon as you open your eyes, boom, boost. It's like, yeah, you have a drinking problem. It's like, all right, well, why is it any different with your smartphone? I was like, oh, I never thought about it like that. Totally um, true, man. And it's it's so easy to fall into the habit of, like, yeah. as soon as you open your eyes, grab your smartphone. It's like, what are people talking about on Instagram? You know, who texted me? Who emailed me? It's like, those messages will be there in an hour. Yeah. Take some time. Talk to your, like, for me, it's like... Uh, my fiance Sammy is always awake before me, so she's up in the kitchen cooking breakfast or wh- whatever. And it's like, take some time, talk to your your other person, you know, um, yeah. and just think about like set your goals for the day, make a to do list, you know, take time for yourself before you start reacting to other people's bullshit. And and w- when I get in that good habit, when it's normal for me to do that, it's like my days just go smoother. You know? Who is uh who? What kind of books are you reading, and who influences you? Mentors or dudes that you like are inspired by? Um, the one I just started yesterday is uh the Four Hour Work Week. Oh, okay. Um, uh, it, it was Sam, Sammy Goddess. She's reading it, and it was just laying there. And I just finished up my other two. Yeah. Uh, I just finished the Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Like that and, one. Read that one. Uh, yeah. Atomic Habits. I'm reading that now. Yeah. Yep. Um, I put that one on my phone, unfortunately, though, and I'm having a hard time reading books <laughs> on my phone, man, because the yeah. things will drop down, and then I got to have, you know, I, I have to check it right now. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Um, yeah, the first book I read that, like, made me realize, like, oh, I, I kind of enjoy reading was um, uh, Outliers, and it it, it, it was crazy. Um, I haven't read that they, one. It's it's a very cool read. It, you know, it just kind of opens your opens your mind to. It basically takes everyone that's the best at what they do, and it's like, okay, obviously you worked hard and all all these things, but what other obstacles fell into place to make you who you are? Um, so you know, like one of the main examples was um, like pro hockey, and it was like eighty percent of pro hockey players have birthdays in like February, March. And I was like, well, That's why is this? And it's because it, like when they're four years old, the age cut off, like at, because of their birthday, they were 11 months older than all the other kids. Um, and yeah, when you're 30, being 11 months older doesn't make a lick of difference. But between the ages four and four and 11 months, it's, day and night difference. Mm -hmm. And so just that compounding interest of like, all right, they got scouted early. So at five years old, they got three hours more rink time at eight years old. They were getting 20 hours more rink time and under better coaching. Um, So it's just that trickle effect. Uh, The other one was Bill Gates. Um, Like why was he the best at computers? He lived right next door to a library that got like the first computer in the world. 
and uh, and he had free access to it. He didn't have to pay for it. So he was one of probably one right. at his age that had right. access to this computer and learned how to do coding and all this stuff. Um, so yeah, it didn't fall into his lap. Like he still did the work, but he's one of the very few that had the opportunity. And then once there was a opportunity to get paid by it, he was leaps and bounds ahead of everyone else. Um, so you know, it's just pretty cool. And like you know, I'm taking those things. I'm like, okay, well, how did that affect my career? You know, what what was laid out for me? Yes, I worked my ass off when I was a weightlifter, and then got into CrossFit. But what hurdles? got moved out of the way for me. And yeah, I'm going through a laundry list of just a hundred different things that, you know, if, if I were in a, a different place at a different time, even by a minute, my career wouldn't have happened. Yeah. You know, the owner of Champlain Valley CrossFit, he never charged me a membership. And, uh, and I was sitting at a traffic light and he pulled up next to me and we knew each other. And, uh, he pulled up next to me at this traffic light and was like, Hey, Hey, we're, we're at a new location now. You should come by. And then I went by the next day. You know, and it's like it's really if, funny. If, if I had turned left instead of right at that intersection, I went to fucking, I went to seen Jade. He went up offered me to come by his gym membership free. Like if, if my first day in the gym, they're like, Hey, it's $160 a month. Right. Yeah. And no way. I were like, Oh dude, I don't have $160. And it's like, all right, we'll hit the bricks, man. Um, because he never charged me a membership. If I showed up to another gym for the first time, it would like there's so many different left and right turns where it's like if it may have never happened. I think that all that kind of stuff is by design. Uh, is my uh, faith perspective. You know, I know that uh, Gary V. I like Gary V. A bunch. Mm -hmm. Talks about yep. like don't get all caught up in like what decision for this or what decision for that because you could go here and then you're hit by a bus, you know. Oh, 100%. You know, instead you didn't go there, you went here. But it's interesting. I'm also caught about – there's a, a thing I read many years ago, and I, I love personal development. I like Tony Robbins, Napoleon Hill, all mm -hmm. kinds of, you know, self-development and become more. But I was reading this thing about – it was uh, talking about – how one sentence that you can say to somebody can literally change the trajectory of their life. So, oh, yeah. like, you, whether they're good or bad, you know, you're a piece of shit, you're never going to amount to anything, or in the case of the book I was reading, it was talking about Stevie Wonder and how he was, um, obviously he's blind, but when he was a kid, he was, like, in a small town and whatnot, and they had a mouse in the schoolroom, and he could hear it. Nobody else could find it, but he heard it. And so his teacher said, wow, you have really good ears. You should, you should maybe go into music. And so I thought about, like, okay, the randomness of somebody mm -hmm. randomly not even thinking about, like, they're going to say something, and it could potentially like a, like, a, like a pool ball, right? Like it changes your whole 100%. direction. Instead of just, like, being, fuck, being random about stuff, and randomly saying to things, what if you intentionally like sought out the best in people, looked for characteristics, particularly if you're a parent, you know, look for things to spotlight and intentionally try to look to change a directory by bringing out the best in people, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? 100%. Or giving them a break in somehow, like, you know what, man, like, you're good, like, you just work out for free, hook me up whenever you can. Yeah, yeah, I'm... Yeah, as corny as it is, like the movie Butterfly Effect. I remember yeah. leaving that and just like my mind was blown because you realize like one thing to the next. Like as small as it is, like you cut somebody off in traffic and now their moods change for the day. Yeah. What effect is that going to have on every person they come into contact with? Yeah. You know, and it's just it, it, it's pretty wild. And you know, part of me keeps it fresh in my mind, and then another part of me is like, no, like just. Live your life. Sure. Just try to Live be a good life. person. Yeah. Keep your side of the street clean. Yeah. Go about your day. So let's talk. Let's talk about like the dopamine effect. Like for me, one of the things that I find is necessary, and even my wife's like, no, you have to go work out. Is um, uh, you know, the, I, I got to break a sweat and I got to release endorphins. Really, for here. I mean, mm -hmm. it's nice to have biofeedback and not be a big fat ass or anything like that. I don't mean anything to anybody. This is for me yeah. personally. And I want to look at myself and go, fuck, you're a fat ass, man. Like, um, but I, it, it creates a biofeedback loop, too. But, 
you're a professional athlete. I mean, it is a career. A prof- it is a profession. And I'm wondering, like, what role does and, – and what I'm saying, does that relate to you? Like, is, is your working out kind of part of your mental therapy, or is it more just like it's a profession for you? Um, so, I mean, in terms of the mental therapy side of things um, – once I'm not doing it as a profession, I'll, I'll keep doing what I'm doing, um, just not the volume. You know, right now it's from eyes open to eyes closed, every decision is towards how is this going to make me a better competitor. Okay. Um, once I return back to like the normal life and, you know, uh, I'll probably work out 90 minutes a day um, and it will be probably 90% for the purpose of keeping my mind right. It's, uh, you know, right, I, yeah, that's just a given cause you're so, you're so, I, I'm probably going, I'm probably going over, over the hill to the other side a little bit. Um, but yes, like when, when I, when I have an off season, when, when I take time off, um, you know, I'll, I literally do nothing because I know in a month you're going to wish you sat here. How much longer um, do you think you're going to compete? Are you going to be, I mean, I'd say like, dude, 16, 17, 18, 19, four years breaking all these records. Are you 20, 21? What's the lifespan? I mean, actually, you've already gone way beyond the lifespan of like a competitive Yeah, competitive yeah so it's, it's crazy to think about right now. Um, so, you know, right now um, I'm the first and only CrossFit competitor to be on the podium six consecutive years. Um, yeah. And, and I, as you were runner about, up actually before you won it the first time you were runner up too right in, uh, yeah so I got second place twice and then and now I've won it the last four years in a row insane um, is that genetics man like what is that you know I'm I'm sure there's some genetic role into it um, but like I, I'm like. It's not 100 percent genetic. I remember my first time stepping into a CrossFit gym. I got my ass kicked by like these middle-aged men that are 50 pounds overweight. Like it was not a pretty sight. Uh, so you know, it took it took a lot. It, it took a very very long time. It didn't come. It didn't happen overnight. Um, it was a lot of very lonely days in the gym, but it was something that I wanted to pursue. So I was willing to put in the time and take the risk. So are you just planning on doing it like for as long as you can do it or do you have any kind of like, what would be I've, the outside like most that you would consider like right now that you could think like I could be champ I, and I don't want to get you to commit anything like that. No, no, no. I, so what, what I've always said is that as long as I'm happy and healthy. Um, so in my weightlifting career, um, at closer to the end of my weightlifting career, I broke my back in two spots. And, uh, and then I pushed through that, you know, I got the surgery, came back from that. And, you know, not only was I not healthy anymore, but I was incredibly unhappy. And, but, you know, for, I was 18, 19 years old. Yeah. Um, I didn't know anything else. I'd been doing weightlifting since I was 12 years old. I was at the Olympic training center, you know, the Olympics was the only thing I knew. That was my goal for the last however many years I didn't. It, it wasn't an acceptable answer to say to myself, I don't want this anymore. You know, I wasn't, I didn't have the social maturity to be like, oh, this was a goal of mine, but it's not anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, just being able, so I, you know, I, I rode that, I rode that bus until the wheels fell off, you know, until I was in a hole. I hated everything. I hated myself because I didn't, I didn't love the things that I wanted to love. Um, how do you feel so, about it now? Are you just are you still loving CrossFit and and all that? I mean, are you? Oh my god! It's like, yeah. I can't wait to get to the gym. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's every day. Like, I I get to work out for a living. Uh, oh, you know, I I never have to sit in a cubicle. Like, I I've I've met my wife. I have this beautiful house. You know, I've met lifelong friends every day I get the train. You're a freaking rock star too, dude. Like, I mean, you may not walk down the street and you're like an actor, but like, you go to CrossFit, man, and you're a rock star, dude. Now, that's crazy. Uh, so, I, I remember, I remember early on. coming up like, wanting to what, selfie. I mean, everything, right? So, 
early on, I remember being like, oh, man, that's so cool. Somebody wants a picture with me. I'm important. <laughs> and then, and then you know, life life kicks you around a little bit, and you realize, like, oh man, that shit doesn't matter at all. Yeah. Um, you know, over the last couple of years, I, I've really learned the the things that old people tell you are valuable. You know. Uh, yeah. It's like you have a few you can count on one hand your good friends. Yeah. Uh, you know, pick a good life partner. You know, all, all these things that you know. When you're young, you don't give a fuck about, you know, you, you want yeah. the flash, you want the, the glamour. And, um, and so, you know, I, I pride myself on the fact that like, I have an amazing, Sammy is incredible. Um, I have She's a few a good friends. Too, right? She's a CrossFitter too. Uh, yeah. Like she'll, she fitnesses for fun. Yeah. You know, she's not in there with us for hours, okay. but like, yeah, she'll come into the gym. She'll be there 90 minutes and then. You know, it's a kiss on the cheek as I'm, like, dying on the ground. She's like, okay, text me when you're on your way home. I'll make you lunch. Um, but, yeah, you know, amazing partner. Um, I'm healthy. I'm happy. I got a handful of good friends that, you know, they, you they sort of the end of the world for me. Um, you're a really deep, pensive kind of person, which is kind of really interesting, too. For me. A lot of times people think that athletes are just like – but, I mean, you're not only – smart it's obvious but you're also very <clears throat> deep thinking which is comes through too and like kind of like at, at 17 or 15 thinking like maybe I got a problem mm -hmm. but what when you evaluate and you're looking at like these kind of things and you said you know old people will say pick a life this that and the other what do you what what is most valuable to you what are what are the things that you'd say is it faith family is it kind of what what is like I mean if you were to say like be dead. What would and 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 you and you were gonna die? Like you'd say, ah, I got it. Like, what's the yeah. most important thing to you, man? So, so the conclusion of that that I have come up with is, you know, a happiness. You know, like I always look at it like, uh, you know, there's no stamp on what makes someone happy. Um, and you know, I've. I've realized that, you know, I've, I've fallen in the trap of doing stuff that was perceived as cool or happy or, you know, successful to other people, and it did nothing for me. You know, I've, I, like, I've driven the supercars, like Lamborghinis, Ferraris, and realized, oh, I couldn't give a fuck about this. What do you drive now? Uh, I have a F-150. And uh, you live in Tennessee, man. You gotta I, have a 150. So, like three years ago, I bought my absolute dream car, and yeah. it was a 1996 F 250 single cab. <laughs> it is like the most backwoods rumbling, just truck. It's slow. It's loud. There's no like. There's nothing fancy about it. It's still got a tape deck. I love tape that deck. truck. I'm I'm not driving by anyone, and they're like, "Oh, look at that! Oh, is that a '96? No, no one gives right. a fuck about that truck." But I think it's awesome. I feel cool when I. Are drive you it. like a not give a fuck type of person? Mostly, I mean, in terms of what people think about you and stuff like I, that. I I try very hard to do what I think is cool. Yeah. Um. You know, through high school, middle school, I I remember going clothes shopping. My mom would take me clothes shopping. And, like, I'd be like, oh, I really like this sweatshirt. She could get it. And I'd be like, oh, no, the guys at school would make fun of me. And and now I look back and I feel so bad for that kid of, like, I wanted to dress a certain way or, you know, do a certain activity, but I was concerned what other people were going to think. And now, now I realize, like, holy shit, who gives a fuck? Like, if, if you pursue that activity or that interest that you think is cool – well, you're going to meet other people that also think it's cool, and you're going to create new friends and be with like-minded people. Um, so I put a lot of effort into not letting these external factors influence my decisions. Um, you know, like I, I try to stick by my values. Um, but the other, the other thing was, you know, besides happiness, that I came to the conclusion that's really valuable to me is making myself proud. Mm, um, that's good. I that I I realized that that was so important, um, and because 
you know, just like day to day training and, you know, with what I do for a living, there's only two options um, when I sign up for a competition. Either I'm going to win or I'm going to lose. And the odds are, like, I showed to a competition, like the last, last one I did, there was 100, I think it was 150 male individual competitors. 149 of them lost. Wow. One, one person won. So, you know, the and odds they're all are... Damn, and they're all damn good, too. Exactly. The odds are stacked against you. And so... <clears throat> How After, many competitions do you do during a year, by the way? Um, in-person okay. competitions, uh, usually three, maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, it used to be a lot more. It used to be, you know, six, seven, eight a year. Um, but that, that's a that's a whole whole different story. Um, but yeah, so it was after my second second place finish at the at the games. You know, I didn't, I didn't show up to the gym for months. You know, I didn't know what I wanted to do next. Uh, you know, I, I didn't know if I wanted to compete again. And um, because I realized there's, there's a real a big differential between for, for the purse too, financially. Oh, oh so I guess it's like two hundred grand or like two grand or something. Like, what is it? Yeah. So the winner of the games is three hundred thousand um, dollars, and then second place. It's like three and, grand. It's got, no, it, I, it, so it used to be. It, since, since I've been there, it's gotten bumped up. I think it's like 75, 80 grand. So, I mean, it's still oh, nothing okay. to scoff at, but it's a very big difference. But then the bigger difference comes with the sponsorships. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, like, and that's where, for CrossFitters, that's where the money's in, Yeah, um, is I the figured. sponsorships. I um, it. You're actually into Nike and everything, man. I mean, props to you, dude. You're, you're you you know, mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're everywhere. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's growing into something that I never saw coming. Yeah. Um, what is your um, just so that I don't go so I don't forget this one because we talk so much about working the kind of like what your workout is be professional. Like, what is your sobriety workout? Are you a meeting guy? Or are you a tw so obviously it sounds like with your background you're a twelve step person. I don't mm -hmm. really we don't really care. I I, I personally like more like abstinence, I, I sponsorship, traditional kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But like, what's your sobriety kind of workout then are you a praying faith person are you keep that stuff what what, what what's your so, sobriety workout so when i first uh so when i first got sober um you know first couple of weeks i just white knuckled it um didn't know what to do or who to turn to and anything you know it was uh it was more just i i figured like oh i don't need meetings um and you know, obviously became miserable and depressed. Like it, it was awful. Um, and then I remember uh, one of my one my my buddy Nate. We saw each other, and he's like, "Hey, man, how's it going?" I never told him I quit drinking or anything, and uh, and I broke down to him, and he was like, "Dude, like, why are you upset right now?" Like I was like, "I don't know what to do." And he's like, "Yes, you do. You know exactly what to do." He's like, "Come to a meeting with us," and uh, you know, just started going to meetings and it, it was very easy for me in the sense of like finding meetings because I never had to find anything or schedule anything. I just literally showed up to Nate's house and, and he, he was one of these guys that, you know, people just gravitated towards him. Um, and so, you know, every night, like we'd all meet in his driveway, four or five different cars would all leave from his driveway packed full. We'd all hit a meeting and then go to dinner after. Um, and that that was uh, huge having that network. You know, it was it was always a meeting then dinner, meeting the dinner, um, and uh, so you know, met a ton it's of people. All about relationships and connection, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's yeah, it, it is. Um, and so you know, early on, he kind of told me he's like, "You need a sponsor." I was like, "I was like, well, aren't you my sponsor?" And and he was like, "No." I'm not your sponsor, I'm your friend. He's like, but like we don't talk about anything substantial. And so I got linked up linked up with a guy and he was uh like militant big book thumper at like homework assignments, everything. And I was like, What the fuck? <laughs> and and you know, I'm I'm still in high school and right. he wanted to hold me accountable because every day you call me 
2.30. As soon as you're out of school, before football practice, you call me. And I was like, well, why, why am I calling you? Like, what, like, do we need to discuss something? He's like, nope, just want to talk to you, see how your day was, you know, that's it. And, uh, yeah, he, he took me through, through my 12 steps. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was kind of a wild time because, I'm like, fuck, I'm 17. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't screwed anyone over. I haven't, I don't have to make amends. And, uh, and then, you know, you start going through, it's like, all right, well, who do you have resentments against? Who, like, and then you start realizing, oh, man, ooh, I haven't taken many people's feelings into consideration about anything. And, uh, Good like, I have, a, I have a resentment against them because I fucked them over and now I feel guilty about it. And so I, you know, uh, yeah. And it was just like homework assignments, just writing out pieces of paper of, uh, who I screwed over, why I did it. Um, and then do you sponsor if, people still, do you sponsor people? Do you have a sponsor? What do you, if you don't mind, it's kind of personal. I mean, no, 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 absolutely. Um, so right now, uh, I do not. Um, and that's, I, I wish I, this is going to sound terrible. I wish I could right now, but it's just like with the amount I travel, my schedule, everything. Yeah. As soon as I'm done competing and traveling as much, like right now, what I would hate is, you know, a sponsor to call me and be like, I need your help right it, now. Man. And me yeah. being like, well, sorry, dude, I'm in London for 14 days. Yeah. You know, um, like in two weeks, Sam and I are packing up and we're on the road for like 41 days. Yeah, and I almost I feel bad even the question coming out of my mouth because I, I don't know what the answer will be, and I don't want to try to make it, you know. So, like I said, recovery, your situation is very, very unique from any, you know, quote-unquote kind mm -hmm. of normal person. I'm, I'm, I, I'm I think I, I think the, the place I can be most beneficial now, and I had no idea of the impact it would have, it was the video I did with Beam. And uh, so Beam is a sponsor, and they just came into it, and it was a very run-of-the-mill, you know, I've done it a thousand times, you know, do a video for a sponsor. There's some interviews and workouts and that type of thing. And so they're, they are a, a CBD company. Oh. And so the guy that was conducting the interview asked me, all right, you know, why is it important to you that this product is the way it is? And... And so for me, you know, before I signed with the company, I did a lot of research, you know, talking to the owners, you know, what, uh, what steps do you take to make sure your product is perfectly clean and all this stuff. And, uh, and so when I answered the question, I said, well, one, you know, I get drug tested for my sport. So I have to make sure that I always pass a drug test and they don't care if it's for like a legit steroid or something as foolish as THC that was a contaminated supplement. They don't give a shit. I'm getting suspended. Um, so that was, that was a big part of it. But then I also said in the interview, I said, I've been sober for 12 years. I want to make sure that I don't have a mind altering substance accidentally yeah. put into my body because I don't know what the end result would be. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I picked up from there, and he was like, oh, like, well, when did you get sober? Why did you get sober? You know, all these different things. And and it went into the video. As soon as the video was released, I got hundreds, hundreds of of messages from people saying, thank you for, thank you for talking about your surprise. Yeah, yeah. I've been sober for five years. Thank you. For, and, and the type of thing, like, yeah, I've been sober 12 years. I hardly talk about it because I didn't think anyone would have much of an interest. Um, so after I saw, you know, the the interest from from people me talking about that in the in the Beam video, I realized like, oh shit, I I should talk about this more. You know, it's it's a huge part of my life. Um, so I you can, use, are you so you're it's what uh, usually I ask with legalization and things like that. So and you got to have inflammation, so you're using CBD for inflammation yep. and stuff like that. Is that part of your um, whole program? Yep. Yeah. So I, I use CBD products. I have uh, I use tinctures before bed to help me sleep, yep. and then um, uh, the 
other product they came out with. It's like a nighttime tea. Um, so it has, you know, it has melatonin, magnesium, just general supplements oh, yeah. that help promote sleep. Yeah. Um, but that's, yeah, that, oh, that's yeah. all I'm using. Well, I have, I got one more question and I could easily talk to you for, you know, uh, a lot longer. <laughs> uh, but I should probably bring it in for a landing here a little bit is I kind of come all the way back around to you being a teenager, um, 15, 16, 17, and again, your situation is a little different because your, you know, your 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 dad is in the uh, the program. But mm -hmm. what advice would you give to um, a young person, a teenager, maybe uh, you know, early twenties, or I, I don't know, maybe anybody? But I'm kind of thinking a little bit in my mind. I'm kind of thinking of a teen type of a person who mm -hmm. is you know, has got maybe some of the issues that you might have had or maybe not had. Maybe there's depression, anxiety, anger, but it's kind of, um, as they say, like dual diagnosis. It's kind of yeah. all mingled, mingled, mingled together in there with maybe like a question that they have, like maybe I got the gene or maybe I do mm -hmm. have a problem. I mean, like if you were having a one-on-one -on -one with some kid that said, hey, you know, and they're going to have the real not a teenager type of thing where they're going to listen, what would, your, what would you tell them? Um, so I mean, kind of like talk, talking to someone that, you know, they're, they're going through some shit and – Yeah, uh, like, a, like a younger person, yep. Um, and, they're, and they're thinking like maybe I maybe I ought to choose you know maybe maybe I ought to like choose sobriety or whatnot or you know. Um, basically, in like any situation, you know, I always say like you know, give it a try, see what changes. Just um, know, yeah. Just, you know, if you're questioning that you're an alcoholic addict, whatever it is, like go. Give it a try. Give a meeting a try. Talk to people in the community. Um, the worst case scenario is you have a bad experience, and then you go back to your regular life. And yeah. odds are you'll you'll have a funny story to tell. Um, if if you do it and there's something that you like, or you see some improvements in your life that you know, like you're, oh man, okay, this wouldn't have happened if I were out using, or you know, I wouldn't have met this person if I were still active. Um, give, give it a try and. I, I think the biggest thing for a younger person that's coming in is, you know, it's tough to say don't be shy, but I think make the realization that everyone has had their first meeting. Everyone um, stepped into the room for the first time at one point or another. Um, so I, I always find that comforting of like, no, I, I, you, like you didn't join the program and have three years of sobriety. You also had your first meeting at one point. You also raised your hand to share at a meeting for the first time at one point. Um, so I, I, I usually find that comforting for myself when I'm walking into a new environment. Um, I, I think uh, kind of touch back on, on what what you were asking me. You know, I think general good advice for young people is you know is you know. Follow your interest. Follow, like, if there's something that you want to do because you think it's cool, do it. You know, um, I, I fought it for a long time growing up. You know, just the way I dressed, you know, uh, what I did in my spare time, a lot of it was heavily influenced by what the people around me would think of it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and it was even stuff like what what kids in school I talked to, you know, uh like what girls I, I pursued, uh, so much of it was based upon like, oh, does she fit into the clique that I'm a part of? Um, and when, once you get older, you realize, oh man, a high school doesn't doesn't count for shit. Yeah. Um, like, <laughs> uh, but then just the importance of like, you're the one who has to live your life. You're the one who has to live with the decision. So like, do the shit that interests you. Um, yeah. yeah uh, I mean, and I, I think confidence comes from that, too, of, like, once you find something that you're interested in, A, you're willing to work harder at it. You're going to get deeper into it. You're probably going to be more likely to su succeed at it if you're interested in it. And that builds that builds a lot of confidence. Yeah, yeah. I think um, so, too. Well, and, I think, and mm -hmm. so one, one, one more thing I want to bring up that I, I think um, 
And it's something that, you know, I, I realized a little while back, and I don't know if anyone else has or kind of thought about it this way. But, you know, like, I, I, I'm an alcoholic. I've been sober for 12 years, but to my core, I'm an alcoholic. It runs in my family. Um, but it, I find that drinking was just a symptom of a personality that I had, that I do nothing in moderation. Um, you know, my dad, my, my dad was 30 years sober. I've, I've never seen him take a drink. But I could, I see it that he does nothing in moderation. You know, it's just, drinking was just the one thing that was, that was negative, that had a negative impact on the people around him. So it's the one thing that's encouraged to stop. Um, so I know for myself, it was, I, I saw people doing it of, um, I was friends with a girl that she was a heroin addict, like full fledged life on the line, heroin addict. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she graduated high school. She was a couple years sober. Now she got her GED, got her undergrad and then went to medical medical school. And it was heroin addict that went to medical school. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And so like it was when she was sober and and then, you know, I've had I've had friends do very similar things of like I've had one buddy that, you know, full on cocaine drinking and now uh like he was on house arrest for a couple of years, lived in a single wide, and now he's running this incredibly successful business. Um he helps tons of people but like these lives that they never would have thought were imaginable but then they realize like oh once i'm interested in something i can i can if i direct my addictive personality into something that has yeah, a man. That, that has a positive outcome so you know for me it was early on it was weightlifting you know i remember you know like 13 years old waking up at 5 a.m before school running to the local gym doing squats at 5 a.m before going to school, during my lunch break at school, the PE teacher would give me the key to the weight room so I could go in and do and get some training in. Right after school, I would go to my actual gym where my weightlifting coach was, train, and then like at night before bed, I'd be doing sit-ups. It was like no one's complaining. No one's saying like, oh, Matt, you got to stop. You're doing this too much. It's like, no, my parents were like, oh, look at him. He's interested in something that's good for him. Uh, yeah. Once I stopped weightlifting and I went, I went to school. Like, talk about an addictive personality. I don't even have one fucking grad. I don't even have one degree. And I, I was like, oh, I want to do two bachelor's degrees and have two minors. <laughs> and, like, and no, no one's, no one's pulling me aside. It's like, Matt, you're ruining the life of the people around you. It's like, yeah. no, good for you. You, you're putting your effort towards something good. And you know, I became obsessed with it. It was yeah. that's, that's what I did. All day Saturday, all day Sunday, every night. I'm sitting in a library reading this textbook cover to cover. And it's I I've realized now that an addict an addictive personality is a beautiful thing if you direct it in the in the into something that's beneficial. Um yeah, you know, I look at it now, you know, I, I train six, seven, eight hours a day. My life revolves around, you know, my training, my competing. And it's something that I obsess over. When I close my eyes at night, I'm thinking about what am I going to do in training tomorrow? What, how am I, this next competition coming up? What can I get better at? What can I do? No one, no one's, no one in my family's complaining of what I'm putting them through. Yeah. No, they see how passionate I am. They see the positive outcome at the end of it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, once my competition career is over, I can't, I can't wait to find the next thing that I get to obsess over and be addicted over and apply this obsessive personality into. Well, it's so interesting that you would say that because um, I have thought, like, as a non-therapist or anything like that, that, like, if you have an addictive type of a personality, like you're saying you do, your dad does, mm -hmm. I do, is I would say the whole thing is I think that people fall into addiction because you have that kind of drive. I don't know what it is exactly, this innate desire. I, I, I know for me it's if one is good, two is better, and ten is awesome. I feel so, the know, same way. When when that the the first thing I saw that with was 
and that it was obvious because the side effects are huge was drinking. You know, like when 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 you're that young drinking that much and it's like all your friends are having one two beers and you're getting blackout drunk. It's very obvious. Um but then, you know, I remember I remember I went through a phase where like I made like a buddy and I made skateboards. Super super like nothing crazy. We just made a skateboard. And uh and he was then like, Cool, I'm gonna go ride my skateboard and then I went off the deep end. I'm making longer ones, shorter ones. Right. It got to the it got to the point that I'm putting motors on them. So I have an electric skateboard, like all these different crazy yeah. I was obsessed by it. Yeah. And you know, this is just like tip of the iceberg, but it's like once I do something and it sparks my interest or I get a positive feedback. You get a dopamine it, hit, man. You get, you get a, a dopamine, dopamine hit and it's like, yo, yeah. I want fucking more of it yeah. right now. Yeah. Um yeah. So That's you know exactly I, I try to find those activities that give you that dopamine hit, but then also have a good end result for yourself and everyone around you. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I think I, I think it's important to know for other people to know that like apply that addictive personality to something that's beneficial. Something that's esteemable. Yeah. And and it's like I've I've seen people in the rooms and you know I I've seen a couple of them come in just like these broken shells of people. And then and it don't get me wrong, it doesn't happen overnight. Like you're gonna go through some shitty times and that's good. You'll never learn more about yourself than when you have an empty wall, empty stomach, uh and a broken heart. You'll never learn more about yourself than when you have those things. And like Good yeah, stuff, man. I, 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 we're so much on the same page. Be addicted. If you're going to be addicted, be addicted to serving other people. Be mm -hmm. addicted to being a giver. Be addicted to being a good dad or a good mom, a good brother, friend. Be addicted to fitness. And people get mad at that word addictive, but I just mean pursue it passionately. Like yeah. if, gonna, if you have this innate desire, channel it to something that is going to make you feel good about yourself. And it's going to also reflect back everybody else around you is going to go, that's badass. Like, yeah, good 100%. Career, 100%. Good stuff, man. Well, I thank you for your time and, and, and really just a lot of real pearls of wisdom and, and advice. And I, you know, I not only applaud you for everything that you've done um, in the physical uh, world, but specifically, man, like, in the sobriety world, it is not a secret that there are people that are influencers, and you're a big one. Um, uh, you're a really big one, and not everybody that is an influencer, some have been sober for many years, is mm -hmm. willing to help to break the stigma or to come out because maybe their PR thinks it will make them look bad, or there's a mm -hmm. movie that they're doing, or there's a this or that, or sometimes they want money. You know, too, I, I applaud that you're the same kind of mindset, like, well, you know, if I can, if one person, that's what we always say, one person hears one thing, and mm -hmm. it helps them out a little bit, so really from the bottom of my heart, man, I just thank you for doing it, it's meaningful, it impacts um, our, I know that our uh, readers are going to love this, uh, they're going to love this uh, issue and learning more about you. And so, how, by the way, how can anybody get in touch with you? I, I forgot that almost entirely. That, well, uh, um, I, yeah, I, I'd say the, the spot that I'm most active is Instagram. Um, okay. My Instagram is at uh, Matthew Fraz, Matthew with one T, F R A S. Um, that's where I'm most active. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll put it in here. We'll put it in the article. Is there anything that you're into that we should uh, t direct people back to, or just back to yourself? Um, yeah. So it, it was actually when when you asked me early on. Uh, uh, of course, of course, it closed up. You know, is there anything that you know I'm promoting? Uh, yeah. One, one of my buddies, and this is to do with sobriety and helping people deal sure, with addiction. Yeah. It's uh, my buddy runs a foundation down in Hawaii. Okay. And so Hawaii deals with like enormous drug problem um, because there's just nothing else to do. Yeah. Um, and so he set it up. I think I think the number I heard was they have 430 kids a day come through their program. Uh, so they run a a free CrossFit program for kids down in Hawaii. 
Um, his name's Aaron Aaron Hoff. Um, you know, he does it. Uh, Aaron Hoff. Yeah. You know, he, he puts his heart and soul into it. Uh, and, you know, I've been down there a couple times to see it. And he's literally just giving kids an activity to do to, you know, to stop them from being bored and turning to drugs. So um, we'll put all of Eric's stuff in the article in here. If you're yeah. watching, there's going to be links somewhere in the article. And yeah, it's the, uh, yeah, it's the Kiala Foundation. And, uh, the Kiala Foundation. Yeah, they, they do phenomenal things. I've been down there firsthand. And, uh, yeah, just one of those guys that, you know, he got sober, um, saw the benefit, and wanted to give back. Um, and so he puts his heart and soul into it. Right but, on. Yeah. We'll promote the hell out of it. We'll promote the hell out of it. We'll promote uh, Kia, uh, Kia, uh, Kia, what was it again? Kiala. K- Kiala K-E-A-L-A. We'll promote the hell out of it. And uh, anybody who wants to get back to Matt Frazier, you can get all those links here on Instagram, on social media. Dude, thanks a ton. Great interview. Appreciate your time. And, um, I don't like to say good luck. I'm just going to be watching for the 2020 games, dude. That is bad um, ass. So if you hang on just a second, this has been another exclusive interview by Recovery Today Magazine, recoverytodaymagazine.com. Hang on one sec. I'll stop the recording.